Welcome back to Forest Farm. Today I'm going to look at planning my 2022 garden. It's a big project, I'm very excited. It's the most exciting project of the year is to plan what seeds to buy and make use of the seeds that you have, what you can beg and borrow and trade with your friends. It's all about working together and uh, coming up with uh, the highest yields and more importantly coming up with an idea behind the entire garden so that you're not planting everything and planting unnecessary things and planting things that take too long to look after. So that's what we're going to focus on. That's what this episode is about. I think probably the most important thing is to find out what it is a workout, what it is that you want to do with your garden. Um, is it to grow food for other people and for your family? Is it to grow cut flowers? Is it to work with herbs medicinally and uh, magically? Whatever you're doing, it's nice to work out where they, those things are going to go in your garden. And one of those things that we have to do this year is plan our crop rotations and our companion plants. Because this is the second year, I noticed that uh, certain vegetables were using more energy from the garden and some of the beds, there are four beds, some of the beds weren't producing anything at all very well. Uh, which means that um, I need to probably do a soil test and work out how much nitrogen is in there, whether the soil is acidic or whether it's too alkali. Um, rather than jump in there and spread ash everywhere or jump in there and spread cow poop everywhere, which I have, I want to make sure that the chemistry is, is balanced and obviously organic for each of those beds. And um, so I've got to do a little bit of chemistry. A reason for crop rotation anyway, regardless of uh, looking at the soil makeup is I used a lot of tomatoes and a lot of potatoes last year. Tomatoes are really heavy feeders and potatoes tend to pull in blights and things like that so you never want to plant potatoes and uh, tomatoes in the same plot in the same area in that plot so I'm gonna, just going to move everything to the to the right. Last year I had I just threw everything in and thought, yeah, let's see what grows. Some worked, some didn't work. I didn't have a lot of problem with rabbits, which is great. So I don't need rabbit fencing or anything like that, which is surprising. Didn't have any trouble with slugs. I had terrible problems with potato blight. Um, didn't have anything go after the tomatoes, but they got nipped because I put them in too early. So um, I'm not putting them in till the beginning of June this year. Um, the May 2-4 weekend might be fine for for further south but up here I think they need another couple of weeks otherwise I'm going to run and I'm going to lose my entire crops and all the seedlings that I put in six weeks ahead of time will all be lost because I just was too quick out the gate so I'd rather have a later season the problem with the later season is I've got my brassicas like my cabbages and my uh, brussels sprouts and things like that they might not come through because there's not 120 days left in the season here and that's they take a long time, they take a long time to grow. The chickens really love the kale so I'm going to turn probably, I don't know, I'll put some Brussels sprouts in but I think I'm going to go with the kale. It grows right through the season, you just keep pulling it, it just keeps growing. Something else that I really enjoyed last year was giving cut flowers to people. Uh, I just met this lovely girl, she's getting married. Uh, her and her husband and what I want to do is I want to plant sunflowers. I've got tons of sunflower seeds from last year. I had 15 foot sunflower seeds. So what I want to do is plant a lot of these on the east side of the garden so when the sun comes round it, these sunflower seeds are not blocking all the light to the rest of the garden. So that's part of planning. Where's your sun going to go? Where's Where are your wet areas in your ground? What likes wet areas? And then we can get into a bit of companion growing uh, which is what plants get on along with other plants some plants don't get along with other plants um, and we can talk about that a little bit later but the point of bringing up about the the meat and the girl was she was really nice and I thought it would be a nice thing to do to take some of my giant sunflowers and grow them for her wedding in October and she doesn't know about this but for me, there's a re really nice reward for me. I'm putting something really positive in the garden for someone else. It's love and light. There's no money involved or anything like that. That's the kind of thing I want to do. And I want to do it with cut flowers. I'm going to really focus on cut flowers. The uh, zinnias were fabulous last year. I've got all the seeds for the zinnias here. 
um, and I've got like chocolate um, chocolate sunflowers but the zinnias were absolutely incredible I bought some asters this year because they're they're beautiful flowers too and that with the zinnias the more you cut them the more you give them away they double up so the more generous you are with the things that you have the the more People are really happy they come around walking their dogs, you give them flowers or fresh veggies or whatever. They're like, this is fantastic. And they're trying to give me money. No, I don't want your money. This is not about money. This is about manif manifesting something really wonderful at a time that isn't really so wonderful. It's my little protest against what's going on out there. It's just to give stuff away. Last year we grew um, enough food for 10 families. This year I want to do 12 families. I want to focus on herbs. Herbs are where, are where my background is. This little book I found here that I started 30 years ago um, has all my plants from from my first real big herb garden in Canada. I'd had herb gardens in England. A lot of the varieties here are very very similar. Um, the growing season is really really short here. I've got a lot of knowledge in herbs for teas, for making potpourris, for making tinctures, for making salves, and the medicinal part of it has really, is what got me into gardening. Yeah, this is kind of witchcraft, I think. If there's any kind of witchcraft out there, it's what you can do for people. Um, and it's all about giving. I think you plan a garden um, and with the intention of uh, helping other people or just being generous to other people it, it it's like it's really it's really fantastic it's what the world needs and that's kind of what I, some of the things i want to talk to you today about how to get the most out of what the idea of your garden is going to be i wanted to talk a bit about permaculture which was developed by a couple of australian chaps in 1974 one of them was bill mollison the other one was david holmgren they decided to take a holistic approach to um, gardening and specifically look at the geography of the place and see where water would, would settle, where the high points, where the low parts points were, where the swales uh, useful for water, collecting water would be, would be put or were already in the environment. And then they looked at indigenous plants and, and took an organic approach to cre uh, increasing yields. Basically, it, it's common sense because you, you're using what's available. For instance, here a pond will be would be run off from the from the water from the roof. So from there, I can build irrigation to my fruit trees, and it's just one thing leads to another. It makes a lot of sense to have a look at permaculture. Try and learn as much as you can about it. It's a deep subject. The other thing I wanted to talk about was a chap called Ralph Steiner. He did a whole bunch of. Uh, lectures on uh, biodynamics and it really revolutionized current uh, farming practices. He started looking at the effects of the moon and the effects of the planetary movements on fruits and vegetables which led to specific times for planting. Now I've listened to the lectures, it's pretty heavy going. I found this someone called uh, Maria Thun, T-H-U-N, she's also German. And her book on biodynamics is called Gardening for Life. <clears throat> Excuse me. It's excellent. It tells you exactly, she studied this for 50 years. She tells you exactly what to plant, where to plant it, what time of day to plant it, what time to harvest. It's an incredible approach to, to gardening that I'd never heard of before. And I thought, what do I know? I know nothing. This woman studied it for 50 years. I'm going to apply it to my garden. I started doing that last year and I had really, really great success. So I figured if I can combine permaculture and biodynamics then it could be even better. Back to the garden planning. We started here, um, a very straightforward looking um, companion layout and then from there I thought well this looks a bit like working in a penitentiary all these straight lines and the problem with all these straight lines and, and planks is is a you slap in toads on the arse every time you walk on them and the other thing is taking a, up a lot of your bed space with trails that you've created and it's not that interesting to look at. What I did was made my garden look incredibly sexy. That's the that's the plan and what I've got going on here is these are actually called keyhole gardens because they look a bit like a keyhole. These trails give me access to all areas of the garden without being straight lines which makes it more interesting for me and so long as the bed's about four foot deep I can get to it from this side 
or this side, or I can walk into the middle. And, and you'll see with the plants that I've laid out um, how that's going to work. So again, this is another bed. These would be tomatoes. Up here are my cut flowers. And then this I'm going to permanently build in for nesting areas for birds and feeding stations for birds. So birds can come here safely, sit there and pick all the bugs off that are coming into the garden. That's permaculture for sure, right there. And then down here, these are my raised herb gardens that I've talked about. And then a bit of a pond, which will probably be further down here compost and then my berry bushes and my fire pit. So this is my plan finished and it's taken all these stages to get to. It's taken a while, but the more time you spend at this stage, the more you'll know what you're gonna do or a rough idea. A lot of this is gonna change, but it, it allows me to go out and buy spuds and onions and stuff like that and beets, things that I know I'm gonna use. These are, I've worked out all the companions plants here. So all of these hopefully will be useful for you if you want to grow these things. You can find out what the, all the companion plants are online. But uh, I think that uh, here we've got my tea garden, here we've got my, my herb garden, here I've got some of my vegetables that were successful last year. Here I've got my spuds and onions. These are my go-to because I use a lot of these onions particularly are so good. Um, it's, they're really, really healthy for you, same as garlics. Um, and then these is kind of like my, my cut flowers and then my, my sunflowers are going to be slightly off the chart here because there's going to be a billion of them. Wet areas will probably be further down here. Compost heaps, I'm going to build two more compost heaps so I can have compost go into each one of these gardens. And at the end of the day, I think with a fire pit at the end and a nice cup of tea or a, a glass of wine or whatever, I think it'll be a lovely place to visit with the birds uh, with the trellis here, I'm going to be putting in some maybe climbing clematis or maybe some hops or something, maybe even some wild grapes. Anything that's indigenous to the area, again, that's permaculture, that's what you want to do. And I'm going to plant um, biodynamically, so I'm really excited about seeing how this works out. Along with the, the zinnias and the flowers and everything, it's every year I am going to like collect as many of as, as my seeds as, as possible. Um, I believe that maybe an onion, um, that's clearly an alien. Um, that's uh, one of those hot things. Beans and squash, fabulous. That was, some neighbors gave me some spaghetti squash and it was absolutely delicious. So there's gonna be a big area for those this year. This is my great grandmother's seed catalog from 1887. And there's one from Sutton Seeds, horticulturalist from 1888. I believe Sutton's is still around. The amount of work to put one of these catalogues together and the drawings are absolutely beautiful. It's in remarkable condition as well. So here's a good example of someone that's put a lot of effort and a lot of time and people would really look forward to these uh, catalogues and pour over these catalogues and take a lot of pride in their gardens. Uh, and, and there's no reason why we can't be doing that today. It just requires a, a little bit more time and a little bit, bit more thought into the planning, which is kind of what this episode's all about. The level of artistry here is just extraordinary. These prints are 135 years old. I don't think we'll be saving our current seed catalogues for 135 years. It's a shame. But anyway, I hope this episode has uh, inspired you to make beautiful things happen in your garden and uh, happy growing in 2022. Hmm. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah. Not a minute. Hmm. <laughs>